Hey everyone, welcome to the Anything Everything podcast with me, Tariq, and my co-host, Sammy. Sammy, how are you doing? All good, man. Yeah, welcome everyone. Yeah. Today, we're going to be talking about quotes and everything surrounding quotes, some misinterpretations, misattributions, mm. and some cool deep ones that we can that we can think about. So, Sammy, when I say quote, what are some of the first quotes that come to mind for you? Things that you maybe resonate with. Right. So, yeah, I mean, we, we've put together a list of things. And, and one of the first ones that I, I keep coming back to, the creative adult is the child that survived. I love that. Good. Yeah. Uh, well, what does it mean to you, though? So, I mean, it, again, and I, we'll get into this a little bit, is that each quote kind of has its, there's depth to it, there's history, there's context behind it. Yeah. When it comes to this, I, I like to think of, at least my nature of work, a bit of a creative endeavor or creative space. Not so creative compared to like other, like more arts, but in terms of our like thinking and the style of work that we do, there's an element of creativity. And, and I've always been attached to creative artists and, and I give respect to what, cre what creativity is. And I, and I try to think, okay, how do people maintain that? How do right. people tap into it and maintain it? So that quote to me tells me that in a sense, you need to maintain that childlike curiosity. The childlike wonder that you have. That um, actually one of my tattoos on my right arm. Okay. It's the tattoo of my favorite game, video mm -hmm. game that I played as a kid. And I was very, very young when it came out. It was on Sega Dreamcast, one mm. of the OG gaming consoles. And the whole point of that tattoo, like the meaning behind it, is to keep the child in me alive so that I don't lose that childlike curiosity, that childlike mm. wonder that this game gave me the most feeling of that, you know, because I got lost in that game. I'd play it, sit down mm. and play it for hours and hours when I was a kid okay. and just immerse myself in that fantasy world. So yeah, that quote, yeah. definitely a it's really a good one. one. And yeah, you want to keep that child, you know, within you alive, that's that the, voice. That's the point of the tattoo. That's the voice. But okay, so double clicking a little bit on that. Yeah. What is it about children that keeps them driven and curious, do you think? So why is it attributed to a child, that creativity? Because you, you, you might not think that, well, children are creative, right? I think when you grow up, you, uh, a lot of people get really narrow-minded in a sense where they are just, they're slaves to the process. Okay. Or to whatever endeavor they're, whatever journey they're on, to the point where they kind of lose touch with that aspect of curiosity. So for example, someone who... <clears throat> is, I mean, I'm just going to say accountant. It doesn't matter what you do. But if you're an accountant at some firm mm. and you work for 10 or 11 hours a day and then you go back home and you turn the TV on and you just brain dead watch some Netflix or some YouTube and then you go to sleep mm. and then you wake up and then you do the same thing. Or maybe you have a kid at home that you need to raise and you need <clears throat> to figure out what they're doing and make sure that they're getting raised right, and you just get stuck in a specific process Routine. where you lose yourself in it. And you stop having that curiosity because there are things that you are constantly needing to be doing, so you don't have time for your brain to wander. And I think that is where a lot of people get lost. And a lot of that childlike innocence and mm. curiosity goes away. Yeah, I like the wander angle. <clears throat> yeah. Excuse me. A yeah. lot of people don't let their minds wander. Yeah. It's like daydreaming was kind of frowned upon growing up. Yeah. But you see a lot of, you know, big, uh, you know, individuals, executives and companies, they swear by it. I yeah. mean, the book around about Jeff Bezos is called Wander and Explore, something like that. Yeah. So there's there's an element there that you need to maintain that. The curiosity, we said curiosity, the, the wandering, daydreaming element. I think it's also about risk, you know, because uh, I think a child has no, in a certain, to a certain extent, self-awareness. And that's a good thing because they risk so much by asking, by trying new things. And they don't care about looking bad. 
And therefore, that's kind of what drives creativity in a way. Yeah. Because creativity and risk, I think, are connected. In a way, they, they would be. You have to take a risk to, to find something creative. Yeah. Uh, to, to There's discover. an element of risk to it. Right. So when you when you kind of you don't care about how you look, you're going to take those risks. The outcome doesn't affect you as much. You're not caring about people's opinions of you, which is amazing. And and you're able to go like, OK, that's fine. Didn't work. I can move on. Didn't yeah. Work. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's kind of how a kid approaches the yeah. world and they just want to learn and they want to understand exactly. and they question things. The I think one of the one of the bigger things also that removes that from from people is that a lot of us are taught as we grow up not to question things. And so we stop questioning mm. them, which removes that inner child from mm. us because we just become too set in our beliefs, too set in our ways, too mm. set in our opinions. And a big part of, I think, progression and growth as a human being mm. is to keep an op open mind about things, to really understand other people's perspectives, other people's opinions. Your opinion means nothing in the grand scheme of things. There are 8 billion other people in the mm. world, all of which have different opinions, different beliefs, and yours is just one yeah. of 8 billion. So being so stuck in that kind of mindset really has, and it's like you, you've heard about fixed mindset and all of that. I think a lot of people are stuck in that fixed mindset yeah. stage, which uh, stops them from being creative which means that they've lost touch with that child that they once were asking all those questions because now they're just too distracted by mm. their own being. Yeah. No, 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 I agreed. Yeah. Um, but that's a, that's a really good quote. Yeah. One, one that I, one that I like a lot is a do unto others what you would like done unto you. Oh. And Gandhi said it in a different way. He said it, um, it's it's a similar thing, but you must be the change that you want to see in the world. Okay, so it's connected to okay. I don't know if they're con they're not necessarily connected to each other, but I think that the important both share a value that is common, mm. and I think it's that when you're acting, try to put yourself in the position of either whoever's in front of you, mm. or try to think about whether what you're doing is actually going to be a positive impact on the world. Like if I'm rude to you, okay. you know, in, in a certain way, and I dismiss some opinion that you gave me about a certain topic, I would, wouldn't want you to do the same to me. You know, so if I imagine you doing the same thing to me, I would get upset. No, I see the point. It, it, it kind of touches on, I think there's like, it's called the golden rule. Yeah. In a sense of uh, don't do, yeah, it's like labeled as the golden rule. And I think it's grounded in empathy, ultimately. And I know empathy is, is a word that is thrown around loosely a lot these days. But the idea is that I can put myself in your shoes and, and vice versa to say that if I'm doing this thing, how will I react if it's done to me? Right. Yeah. And, and that, you know, suspending that action a little bit and thinking about it can, can just go a long way to treating people yeah, it's uh, definitely rooted in empathy and compassion. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of people lack that today as well. Like I see people doing all kinds of stuff that's like, would you accept someone doing that to you? Yeah. You know, like how would you feel if someone does that to you? I think, and back to your point a little bit, is that we're so caught up in the routine of life that sometimes you just need to stop and think a little yeah. bit. Uh, and, and I know we all say it, We everyone, most people have these intentions. It's just that when you're, so stuck in the routine, you're late for something, your 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 impulses are off. Yeah, you know, like uh, the dashboard is is ringing and alarms everywhere. So you, it's hard to kind of ground yourself and just. And that's why they say like take that five minute breather or meditate just to clear what's on your mind and and reassess your moment, the day, whatever. Uh, so it's a good one. Yeah. Segueing a little bit in in terms of this, th there's a quote around. Uh, and you talked a bit about this in, in the first point, but uh, if you if you ask a question for a minute, or or the one who asks a question is a fool for a minute, the one who doesn't ask is a fool for a lifetime, something like that. Mm. I think it's Confucius or some Chinese sort of quote. Um, so it's tied to your point that be curious, ask, and and don't fear the consequences. Of um, uh, to me, uh, how do you see it? Yeah. 
that's it ties a lot into that curiosity aspect and the inner child. A lot of people have, I don't know if it's an insecurity, but they have a problem with admitting that they don't know a certain thing <clears throat> or that they need to understand more about a specific topic because they don't understand enough uh, because they don't want to be seen as ignorant. And so because of that, <clears throat> they stop asking questions. And because they stop asking questions, they actually are ignorant about that specific topic. Okay. So it's kind Self- of like a full circle. It comes self-fulfilling. In, yeah, it I is. Understand. It is. It is self-fulfilling. You're driving it by your actions. Um, what you're trying to avoid, you're actually getting it. Yeah. yeah. So one thing that Paradox. I tell I tell my team all the time is, no matter how stupid you think a question is, ask it. If you need to know the answer, ask it because if you ignore it, it's bad because then there's a gap in your knowledge. Mm-hmm. And sometimes if you try to go in and find the answer for yourself, it's going to be very, very inefficient when someone can answer it for you and tell mm-hmm. you in 30 seconds what the answer is because 100%. they know if it's their field of expertise mm-hmm. or whatever the question is. Completely agree. It's, it's almost, number one, you're, the consequences are much more are dire and, and they're worse off if when you don't ask. And, and number two, I think that we we focus a lot about again this is maybe it's down to social media and other factors is that we care so much about our image when in reality nobody's nobody's really caring oh my god you messed up and you didn't know that and I think there's also a point around the definition of ignorant straying a little bit is that we think ignorant is bad ignorance is just a lack of knowledge I don't think there's anything I think people might default to thinking ignorant means stupid when, it's not the same thing. Absolutely, right? We, we seem to like draw that connection is that if you say you're ignorant, you're stupid. We're, you're just admitting that I just don't know. And, and you shouldn't know everything. You can't. You can't. You actually can't. Yeah, there's the Socrates quote, right? I know uh, that I know nothing. Yeah, if yeah. there is one thing I know, I know that I know nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's how he kind of, he went around uh, Athens at the time trying to to disprove what the oracle had said that Socrates is the wisest person. And he was, it shocked him apparently as the story goes is that he was so shocked, he went around and kept asking people and then he realized, he's like, it's just, it just comes back to them not admitting that they don't know. And just by him admitting that he's- He's the wisest. He's the wisest in a sense. So it's, uh, I hope it's true in, in the sense, right? That he went on that kind of quest to really disprove the, because he, he could have like taken it in a very grandiose I don't, way. Uh, Socrates was an extremely humble person. I don't think he would have taken that yeah. in the grandiose mm-hmm. way. The thing though is you could see how long ago in history that was. And we still see ha- the same thing happening today, right? Like, even though a lot of, like, you have all these quotes, all these teachings about yeah. keep being curious, keep asking questions, uh, be comfortable mm. in not knowing things, all of that. And yet you still see mm. that being a huge barrier for a lot of people yeah, 100%. to progress forward as human beings. And mm. I, 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 f- I understand why in a way, uh, I'm not someone who shies away from asking questions personally, but I do understand why in some situations it might seem like there's our ego that we're kind of trapped in. Mm-hmm. The that friction, we, there's friction too. Yeah, that we don't want to be seen with vulnerabilities. Yeah, and 100%. Not knowing or admitting not knowing something is, is like a vulnerability in a way. It just sucks in the moment. I think that's the f- fact of the matter. It's just in the moment, it just sucks to not know what you're talking about or, or what, and especially if somebody is expecting, the expectation is that you should know. Yeah. And I think it, it comes up, with me and projects and, and with the people around me is that in, in that moment, you, you kind of, you go back to the instincts. I think the instinct is to just protect your ego, protect your your standing and reputation, whatever that is, yeah. right? But uh, but yeah, to your point and segueing a little bit is that they've we misinterpret quotes as well a lot. For right? sure. Is that there's so many quotes, we misinterpret them. Maybe we don't apply them well. And I think a lot of quotes overlap or contradict each other. Yeah. So we can any... talk about like some of the quotes that we, uh, I guess, that are misunderstood or misinterpreted mm. in a way. So money is the root of all evil. Mm. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. Okay. So what, what do you think when you hear that quote? Money is the root of all evil. Yeah, it's just, uh, I mean, I read a little bit about this one, but, okay. but I'm going to try and, and, and not, uh, I'll leave it to you to, to no, explain. No, I mean, you could, you could say what you read about it. So I saw that it's, it's actually 
the love of money that is the root of all evil. Yeah. So it's been misinterpreted, changed, the, the, the meaning has eroded over yeah. time. So what people attribute to that quote is that money is inherently evil mm. in and of itself. Yep. When actually the quote comes from the Bible mm. and it's the love of money is a root for all kinds of evil. So it's not money itself. It's that if you as a person mm. have this love for money, it could make you do all kinds of evil acts. Yeah. And I mean, mm. we can talk about why that makes more sense, right? Because if you do love money and you're a very greedy person that wants money um, almost without really looking at what the consequences are for you to go and get them, you start doing the most unethical shit in order to be able to get that daughter. So I get, I get the love of money part, but that's one of the misunderstood mm. or misattributed quotes. No, no, absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's one that I wanted to cover and it's it applies, but also it doesn't apply okay. in a sense. So it, it can open up in, in two different avenues. So to the man with a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Right. And that to me, just off the bat, it tells us about a an inherent focus on, you know, one tool or one mindset to every problem, right? Because this was attributed to Mark Twain. And in his mind is that, okay, you're, you're trying to solve a problem. And if you only have one tool or one mindset or one way, everything is going to look like a nail. So you have one framework to apply to everything. Mm. Now, I think that can work and in some scenarios and in some scenarios it can't. Yeah. So I think that's the, there's a balance and nuance that is required. How do you, how do you see it? Yeah. In my head, it just means that if you... Like whatever tool you have at your disposal, use that to solve whatever problem that you come across. Mm. So some people who are good at a specific, if they're very good at uh, math or engineering, mm. they try to look at every problem that comes their way programmatically. And mm. sometimes that means that they could lose efficiency because you need to look at it in a creative way and not an analytical mm. or a mathematical way. That's kind of looking deeper into the quote. Mm. So yeah. I don't know, like to me, this quote isn't, it's not like a, I don't think it's a positive or a negative. I think it's just that you have the tools you have. And so you can only mm. approach the problem wielding the tools that you have. But the under the undertone, I guess, is try to expand your horizons mm. and what you're what you're good at and what you know so that you can tackle problems more effectively or more efficiently based on your knowledge. Agreed. But yeah. That's kind of uh one 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 misinterpreted one is uh nice guys finish last. Okay. I mean it's said a lot today mm. uh, as well like in, in a lot of circles, you know, nice guys never get the woman, for example. Like, okay, I'm such yeah. a nice guy. Why am I finding someone? Mm. So nice guys finish last. But it's actually not that, like, like the, the person who said nice guys finish last was talking about the New York Giants team. So they're a baseball team, the New York Giants. And the coach thought the players were all really nice players. But mm. they would finish last every season. And it, he was just saying that they're all nice and they finish last. But it wasn't intended to be nice guys finish last as in nice guys never win. Mm. Or like related to the dating market. Or, or even related yeah. at all to dating. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So that's a quote that's been taken out of context, applied somewhere, and to a certain extent is believable and, and carries some weight. It does carry some weight right? the way it is, okay, right? Like okay. you, you kind of... Yeah. Like... A lot of people resonate with it. It's like, why, uh, why do, why do women go for the assholes or something like yeah. that? Yeah. So one angle is that, but the other is that, and, and focusing on sports ultimately is that you see the examples of teams, great teams or great individuals that they're they're just they're assholes. They're ruthless. They're ruthless. Yeah. That's that's the, the exact term, right? Like Ma Michael Jordan comes to mind. Yeah. Is that people from the you know Netflix documentary? They say that he wasn't a very nice guy. Yeah. But then how do you know he, he wouldn't have had this career if we had changed? If he was 1% nicer, maybe he wouldn't have had the career he had. So there's to, to every great achievement, in a sense, there are trade-offs or externalities, negative, that you just have to accept, yeah. right? And, and, and there's an obsession 
to uh, angle to it right is that you need to have that aggressiveness that uh, uh, hard work kind of beats talent right when talent doesn't work hard so even if you don't have the talent you can be the worst kind of like player but if you're just uh, another quote i'm jumping around a little bit is that you can't be someone who doesn't quit so that's mm -hmm. kind of like how it makes sense with it is that if you show that you don't quit you actually will achieve a lot um but it, it's been again that can be taken to an extreme and Oh, for sure. Get to the point of burnout, right, as well. Yeah, 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 definitely, um, yeah. definitely. So there's, there's, again, I know we say this a lot and people talk about this a lot, we're not the first, is that it's about balance, but nobody tells you how to achieve balance and no one tells you where to draw the line. Yeah. That is the biggest mystery in life is that everybody can say, oh, it's just about balance. And that's a quote that maybe has become a meme. It's a quote is that, oh, it's just about balance. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> what, what is the balance? How do I achieve it? Yeah. And what's balance for you, for me, for now, for this moment? Because times change. Times definitely change, uh, people you change. Know, there's so many, you know, factors and, and the criteria and weights that, that uh, affect it. So it's all about balance. Okay, amazing. Oof, I've, I've learned yeah. so much. Yeah. Or like the phrase, it depends, right? It can, it used to mean something more like intellectual and someone that when you ask him a question, he takes off his glasses and he pauses and he goes like, you know, it, it depends. Now it's just a meme in consulting. You just say it depends on everything. So it's become a joke. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if it's the case in your industry. I mean, the appearance of uh, of uh, wisdom and uh, intellectual uh, rigor. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it. Everything depends ultimately, right? Like, <laughs> exactly. It's just, yeah. It's. I find it a bit silly. Like, but if you're if you want to <clears throat> say it depends about something, it has to be. Well, you have to provide context. So if someone asks you a question, mm. and there are two answers that could be correct depending on what situation you tackle, then you need to explain the context about why it depends. Mm -hmm. But just it depends in a vacuum, it doesn't mean anything. It does, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it does because everything depends. What do you mean? Yeah. Right? Yeah, what so that's, have... uh, th th that, do you have any other ones that are, I have one more that's misunderstood. You go for it. It's uh, taking the road less traveled. So let's take the road mm. rest, less traveled. Okay. A lot of, from what I understand, a lot of people think it's about trying to take the path that very few people have taken before mm. instead of taking the path that most people take. Go on your own. Yeah, yeah. So so go your own way. It could be attributed to a career, uh, artistry. Mm. Uh, it could be even attributed literally if you're doing a hike and you see a path that's really well-treaded and another one that's not well-treaded at all and mm. seems mysterious. There's some allure to taking the road less traveled, right? There's okay. something about exploring and finding out what it means. But actually, the origin of the quote uh, comes from Robert Frost uh, in, from a poem called The Road Not Taken. Mm. And in it, it's more about the road less traveled by you. So if, if you're in, on a fork, for example, and you always take road A and you don't take road B, or if you're in a decision matrix and you always take this decision and not that decision try to take that decision once even even it doesn't matter what other people have taken mm. so there could be two roads ahead of you both equally well traveled but you only take road a all the time taking the road less traveled means you take road b regardless of what what, what other people take that's okay. actually what the quote means so step out of your comfort zone really is another is way okay. of of putting it take mm. the road less traveled step out of your comfort zone so it's not about going where less people went necessarily. Mm. So it's not about a rebellious view of a society and, you know, exactly. the, the masses. Yeah. It's more about you just stepping out and, and changing your environment and in, injecting some randomness. Yeah. Right. And, and, and changing your routine. Yes. In, in a sense. Yes. Okay. Uh, you know, you know what it's like stepping out of your comfort zone, right? Like that's mm. kind of where growth starts. Growth begins at the end of your comfort zone or something like yeah. that. I can't remember exactly what the quote is, uh, but th that's what taking the road less traveled means. Okay. Yeah. Even though the other, the other interpretation is also alluring. Mm. Let's take the road less traveled because there's curiosity. There is like, what's, why don't more people take this way? Mm. But that's not that's not really mm. okay. Yeah, there's a sense of adventure. There's more like you can discover something, and okay, yeah, uh, interesting. Mm. Do you have any more or no? I mean, we can move into uh, some that are co mm -hmm. uh, contradictory, contradictory quotes. Yeah, yeah. If you have, yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, so, for example, there is the 
absence makes the heart grow fonder. Okay. Right? Which means that if you're gone in Spain for three months, I'm going to miss you because, you know, and think better thoughts of you. Okay. The an opposite quote is out of sight, out of mind. So you're in Spain for three months. I don't see okay. you. So I don't remember you, like anything mm. about you. So those are two quotes that are, have you've heard of them both, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it, they're more attributed to, right, uh, the relationship and... Um, I don't know. So, so I think it's more attributed to relationship and seduction, but it, it applies if, even with like friendships. Uh, Is out of sight, out of mind attributed to relationships uh, as well? The first one, I think. I think the first Absence one. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. Yeah, because I mean the heart element, right? Uh, yeah. Is, is about, and I think it's it's a way, his, it's a historical one in a sense. Um, back in the day where people weren't as connected. I think it's, so if I were to personally kind of attribute it to anything, <clears throat> uh, Lebanon, hmm. right? So that's where I grew up a lot of my childhood. Mm. Not being in Lebanon makes me think fond memories of Lebanon about okay. like how, like the positive memories are the ones that surface mm. mostly about Lebanon, the, the fun times that I've had. Okay. But Lebanon, actually, when I go visit, it's, it's mm. trash. It really is like a shithole. Nostalgia um, is a hell of a drug. Yeah. In a and sense. so that's what that's what I think when I think of absence makes the heart grow fonder. Because I'm not there, mm. I kind of have this fondness towards it that mm. when I'm there actually isn't there. If I'm in Lebanon, that fondness goes away. I'm like, okay. you know what? Mm. Screw this country. But I, it's also, I think it's kind of around this idea of that just the, the change in perspective. Right. Where you know that there's an example of an image that a person on a boat just wants to see land and a person on on an island just wants to get off the island. Yeah. So everybody is just like, the grass is always greener, kind of, in a, in a sense. Yeah. Is Which that is also another quote, right? The grass yeah. is always greener. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it always applies, right? Because again, it, it. I think the problem with some of these quotes is they're taken to an extreme. They're taken yeah. to an extreme and, and you think that they, they always apply or it's always good. But it's actually it good. the grass, uh, the, the quote is actually like the grass always seems greener on the other mm. side, right? So that's the exact quote, okay. I think, or it's something that, that means that because mm. the the whole point of the quote is you're, you're going to get bored of the situation that you're in and anything new is very alluring because of its novelty. Yeah. But yeah. it's not necessarily yeah. going to be better for you. Mm. Yeah, you just want to change. You want to kick the routine. Kick yeah, the, yeah. Every once in a while. Yeah. But but uh, back to the quote around. You know. Okay, I'm trying to interpret the first part of it. Is that absence makes the heart uh, grow fonder? Right. Was it? Is that again? This could be. I mean, just my own theory is that there's a sense. In a sense, there's a balance between. I think the early stages of relationships where th you need to have a bit of absence once you inject some good, you know, feelings and and sharing of vibes and and achieving and, and finding commonalities and liking each other. So that's one angle. And then the other angle is that, okay, I need to create some distance so that you can get missed right. from both both parties. Oh yeah, I agree with that. Right, and then the other side is that, okay, you after, if, if you put too much distance, the, you, you're, you're gonna you're forget lost. about them. You're, you're, yeah, you get lost because yeah. you, you get busy in other things. And that's so, where out of sight, out of mind comes in. I think so. So that there's, again, there's a, there's a fine, real fine formula to, to seduction, I'm, I'm assuming. So I, I don't know if it's to. just about seduction, though. I, I think so. I'm attributing it to it. Yeah. Uh, but attributing it to, to that. But yeah, yeah the, you can apply it to so many things. Yeah. Uh, it could be with family. It could be with friends. It could be with, you know, with anything. Yeah. Um, to a certain extent. Uh, another cool one. Be Birds of a feather flock together. Do mm. you know what could be a contradictory quote to that? No. Opposites attract. <sighs> That's a tough one. Right. Yeah. Like, aren't they kind of? I think the first one is more around family and the bond between a family, right? Because birds, birds of a feather flock together. I think so. I think it's more about the circle of friends that you have. Okay, could be. I've always interpreted it as a more of a family thing. I see. You know, that you stick to the, the nest that you've been brought up in. But that could be friends as well. Because yeah, that's to your me, it's like the people that you kind of uh, talk mm. to and you attribute yourself to as your acquaintances and your friend circle. Mm. They're more <clears> likely <throat> to have your kind of moral compass, your thoughts, mm. your uh, interests. Preferences, yep. Preferences, birds of a feather flock together. Mm. That's kind of how I attributed that. Okay. But opposites attract kind of says the opposite thing. <laughs> yeah. 
right? It does. But I think opposites attract is more from a main take perspective. It is. Right? Not a friendship perspective. That's what how we've been brought up, at least. Uh, or that that's the, the view in the, uh, uh, the ether of the discussion. Yes. I, that said, I don't know how true opposites attract is. I was going to say that. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, if you're yeah. so different from your partner, I don't think it's going to work. I think so. I, I think there's a bit of, it's become a bit of a myth that opposites attract. I because so. I've read about this a lot. Okay. And they actually say that generally you need more things in common than things that you're not in common with for a healthy relationship. Exactly. Like, like on generally, again, like it's a huge sample that, that's required to really assess this. But when you look at the average couple that have lived together for 30 plus years, for example, they, they have things in common. It just, it just makes sense. Yeah. It's much more logical. You can, of course, it can happen. It can exist that people are just two different people, but they must have a few things that they fall back on, right? Right. They default to that they can do together. Otherwise they're not spending time together. Definitely. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's, and uh, you even see it in society. Mm. Like most people, let's just take it from a racial perspective. Mm. When you see an Arab man, it's much more likely that they're with an Arab woman, a white man with a white woman, mm. uh, whatever, Indian man Any with an Indian woman. It's a cultural, sure. Like there's a cultural element to it. There's mm. also a Religious. familiarity, closeness, that kind of thing. But at the same time, it's like, most people you see that are together aren't actually that different. It's not about opposites attract. Yeah. Sure, there are things where, you know, if someone that like your partner is good at a certain thing mm. and you're good at something that complements that and you work well together, great. In that sense, sure. Like, for example, um, my wife loves making lists and planning things. And I'm someone who's mm -hmm. very spontaneous and just spur of the moment. Yeah. So in that sense, we kind of tug each other in the right direction. I'm okay. too spontaneous sometimes, she reels me in. Mm. Uh, she gets too rigid with her planning sometimes. I inject a bit of spontaneity to liven things up. Okay. Uh, so that kind of works. But we're mm. not, there are a lot of similarities between us as, as well. You know what I mean? Like mm. the way we think about the world, uh, what we think is right versus what we think is wrong. Makes we're sense. very similar in that sense. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. I, yeah. I, I tend to agree. Another cool one. Actions speak louder than words. That's a nice one. That's a big one. <laughs> but then the pen is mightier than the sword. Right? Okay. Because when you think of the pen is mightier than the sword, you're saying the word is mm. more than like cutting someone with a sword. But it's a huge metaphor though, right? It's it's a... It's uh, also like it's a opposite to sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. The pen is mightier than the sword. It's kind of like, it's... The, yeah. the, contextually, the context, yeah. I think contextually it's different. But that's the thing, right? Uh, they may seem at face value contradicting, but, yeah. but it's very, it depends on the context. It definitely depends uh, on the context. But I think words can be very painful. I do not think, so sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I don't think that's true. I think people get traumatized by words more mm. than they do by sticks and stones in some cases. Yeah. Emotional damage from words can mm. be more Harmful. traumatic mm -hmm. than getting hit. Yeah, it, it kind of, I don't know who said this in a sense, is that the scars that you don't see actually hurt more than the scars you see yeah. in, in a way. Yeah. And that just tells us that physical pain always heals. Right, uh, to a certain extent, right? Uh, up to a certain limit, because if, if it's way too much, you're, yeah, it could be like a loss of limb or something. Yeah. But the emotional pain is beneath the surface. So the it's kind of counterintuitive. You yeah. think that, oh, when you don't see it, out of sight, out of mind, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah. But when you don't see it, it's actually bottling in. And that's what psychology ultimately says, right? Is that anything that's been bottled actually either comes back with a vengeance. Yes, it does. To a certain extent, so. Yeah. Uh, Definitely. That's a good one. Actions speak louder than words is more attributed to if you're if you're someone who's full of ideas but never actually puts the action in, mm -hmm. or you're someone who says do something a certain way, but then you do it differently. Like for example, when you're raising kids, if you're telling them to do something and then in your behavior you do the opposite, they're gonna emulate your behavior, 100%. not what you're telling them. And that's kind of where action speaks louder than words sits. So yeah, like we said, contextually they're different, even though mm. if taken at face value, they seem like they're they're complete opposites. 
Yeah, there's two points to it in a way, the way I see it is one is, as you kind of alluded to, is leading by example. Yeah. Leading by example goes a long way beyond just rules. Yeah. And the other is a kind of, from a business point of view, it's like execution over strategy. Yeah. In a way, like your your strategy is only as good as how you can execute it. So that's, yeah, that's, that's how I interpret it. Yeah. Um, all right, let's, let's, we can... Move into a different avenue a little bit around, yeah. okay, why do we think quotes are so, you know, attractive? Why are we so, you know, attached to quotes? And and I did a bit of research, just, just you know, numbers quantifying. On Instagram, there's, there's a huge number of posts just around quotes, quotes of the day, you know, quote and quotes, you know, and plural. How many, how many do you think there are? How many posts on Instagram about quotes? Millions. So yeah, give a number. What do you? 60 million. 60? Yeah. Well, one of the hashtags is, is close to 60, 80. But quotes, uh, quote, quotes, and quote of the day together are over 300 million. 300 million. Posts. Yeah. Uh, I mean, as of this morning on Instagram. Uh, there could be more. They could, you know, they could overlap a little bit, but just together... That's, that's, it's a lot of quotes. That's a lot of posts, right? And yeah. That's a lot of quotes, a lot of posts. A lot of post yeah. quotes. <laughs> so there's something we're we're attached to them somehow. We 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 like. I, I think. I mean, there's a number. There's a number of reasons. I think, and and I've looked uh, looked this up. I there is something romantic about quotes. Yeah. Right. I think so. Like there's a feel good effect. There is. Yeah. yeah. And there's also like the how you relate to them mm. and the way that they could be witty. Uh, you mm. know, so because they're usually metaphorical. Yeah, and and they're short, like less is more. They're kind of minimal yes. because they say so much with few with, words, with very few words. So yeah, so that's I feel like there's an artistic side to it as well. Definitely. So there's a creative side, the artistic side, and there's the side where, as humans, we like to kind of latch on to ideas and things. Mm that explain the world that we live in and give meaning to mm. our lives. And I feel like quotes do that a lot because mm. if something happens, you know, you can, if something happens in your life and you can attribute it to a quote, it kind of makes you feel easier about it. Like, you know, Murphy's Law, the quote that's like, if something can go wrong, it probably will. Mm. That's a quote. So something goes wrong in your life, you're just going to be like, ah, if something can go wrong, it probably will. So it, it's, it almost makes you deburdened or unburdened mm. in that sense, right? Okay. Because there's that quote that makes you feel better about, about things. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, if you're away from someone, like your significant other, and you think, well, absence makes the heart grow fonder. So I'm gonna, mm -hmm. I, I love you more now or whatever, whatever mm -hmm. happens from there. You know, so you kind of, I think that's how, that's how they work. Like they could ground you into, they could ground your mindset into a few words yeah. and explain things. Yeah, no, no, I agreed because it kind of, it reaffirms that kind of your cognitive landscape of the world. Because we, we see the world in our own interpretation, our own perception. Right. And in, in bite-sized amounts, ultimately, right? Because you're, the world is much larger than we can perceive. And your mind just like distills all of that uh, in, in various ways, heuristics, whatever biases. Part of it is, is a quote in a sense, because isn't the quote, if you think about it, kind of like a hypothesis of a scenario? So it's, it, there's a bit of a scientific element to it because it's the person who came up with the quote had a lot of data points, experience, and then he hypothesized that this quote summarized that scenario in a way. That's just my, my own theory of it. Um, yeah. The, how does that, does that make sense? I mean, yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. It's, yeah, the people that come up with quotes usually come up with them based on their life experiences yeah. and where they are at a certain moment. And because humans in general, we're very similar in a lot of ways in that we mm. are experiencing this life and we get hurt in certain ways and we get happy because of certain things happening mm. to us. When good things happen to us, they make us feel good. When bad things happen, they make us feel bad. So coming up with these smart little quotes to summarize the human experience, it's pretty alluring. It is, it is. It's actually amazing in a sense is that we we're trying to, you're noticing patterns. You see patterns in the world with yourself or with others, and you're trying to explain it in a summary, 
uh, in that sense. And, and, and it's a theory in, in a sense. That's where I think they, some of them don't apply because it's just a theory that just doesn't apply all the time. Yeah. Um, so another one is, so there's kind of two sides to it as well, is that from one side, as you were saying, it's kind of like it attaches you to a thing that is within you yeah. that you want to see in the world. And on the other side, it might be you trying to differentiate yourself by finding a quote that makes you unique. Okay. So there's, it's a fine balance, don't you think? Is that you're trying to, I, I want this quote to help me connect to others. So I feel part of that intellectual group or that society or whatever. And another side of it is, no, I'm actually different. Okay. Right? So give me an example of the latter. What, the what kind of Yeah, what kind of quote would make you feel different? You were saying we were talking about like children, right? Yeah. And, and asking questions and, and trying to think differently and being curious. Part of it is maybe when you grow up in a society, in an example, that is relatively fixed in one way. And then you find a quote that tells you, you know what, it kind of reaffirms that inner rebel in you. So that's kind of how I, I might see it, is that you taking the road less traveled in okay. a way is, is like you attaching to your, yourself to that quote that is anti your establishment, your society in a way. Okay, so I, I guess an one, one quote we could say that with is, hmm. be the change you want to see in the world. So if the world around hmm. you is a certain way and you feel like that's wrong and you wanna make it right, yeah. then you're, you act in a way that's different to how everyone else is acting in order to create some sort of ripple and make the world change. Hmm. So there is there is that rebellious nature so. to some of the quotes yeah i think so because and then you see and, and like instagram is, is one of the most popular websites and, and social media applications out there and you see there's a heavy you know uh, dependency or or push for people to attach themselves to these quotes either for inspiration or motivation yeah but then this raises the question now so we kind of touched on why our our own psychology pushes us towards that but does it really work is the question do you think and we talked about this in a way with motivation and discipline. Does a motivation, inspirational quote actually help you? What do you motivation think? and discipline. We have an episode on dip discipline. Go watch that. Yeah. So does it actually help? I think in some situations it might, but then in other situations it could be taken to an extreme where okay. you attribute it, you attribute a certain behavior you have to a certain quote, even though it isn't the quote's fault or you shouldn't really take the quote as like to mean literal, literally mm -hmm. what it says, yeah. because it obviously depends on, on the context and depends mm -hmm. on the time in which you're interpreting the quote, because yeah, you could end up, you could end up in situations that are potentially bad for you if you stick to a quote too much. But I feel like people want something to lean back on and to believe. Mm -hmm. And quotes are one way that people can attribute their identity to something that makes them feel better about themselves. But yeah, you can go too far with it. But in other times, I feel like it can be helpful. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and, and I can see scenarios and instances where it can help. The only issue I think I found is basic research on this and um, it's it's hard to test as well i think okay but how sustainable are they like if you if i read a quote every day or a motivational quote that one that pushes me to exercise th does it help me stay consistent mm -hmm. i think that's where we, we kind of actions speak louder than words in a sense using that quote yeah as a meta yeah in, in the scenario is that if the quote doesn't lead you to action then it's kind of failing you in a way mm. because you you need action, right? You actually need to do things to prove that you are the thing because you're attaching yourself to an ideal. Right. And and the, the statement gets you on that path, but you have to, you know, keep it going. You have to finish it. So I, I think that's where at times some of the research is saying that, you know, the quotes really don't help. Um, but but again, it's 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 very tricky to 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 assess it and, and it's uh, success rate uh, in, in, in a way okay yeah you know and, and i'm i don't want to use that quote like actions speak louder than words too much uh, but in maybe that's more one of the more more robust quotes is that really you, you can't really fault it you can't really destroy that quote and break it down 
um, and critique it because yeah. nothing beats just doing the work, whatever it is you want to do. Go to the gym, fix your diet, be consistent, read that book, uh, talk to someone better. You know, um, the action is, is is there. You have to commit. Mm. And it comes back to the idea that as a child, you just don't care. Just do things, take risks. Um, so I think to sum it up, I know we, we've said, we've said, you know, a, a lot on this is that in a sense, quotes, they, they have value, they have meaning. There, it's, it's, there's nothing wrong with attaching yourself to it. But when it goes to an extreme where you're not acting, when you're not changing and adapting and taking risk, then what is the quote really doing for you? Yeah. It's just me. I feel like mm. people take it to be as par a part of their identity in a way. And that's when, that's when I feel like they <clears throat> reach a point where they're no longer growing or progressing. But again, in the end, like, does everyone need to have an open and growing growth mindset? Mm. Or is it okay for some people to have a fixed mindset? That's a much deeper conversation, it, it I is. think. And it's not necessary. It depends on what you want in life. Yeah. You know, ultimately going back to your quote is that if you're, if you are in a fixed mindset, but you're just not, you're not doing unto others what you wouldn't want done to you, then you're not harming anyone. That's fine. Yeah. You know, not everyone has to be ambitious and grow and reach their full potential. Yeah. I guess some quotes, if you live your life by them, it's a good thing. Yeah. Like if you live your life by do unto others what you would want done to you, I think that's a good thing in general to just keep with you. Mm. Right? I think so. The only, and this is where I might challenge it a little bit, is that apparently if this is under the labeled the golden rule, there's actually a platinum rule, which is if when you treat people the way you want to be treated, you're assuming people are actually going to treat you that way. Or or they accept your level of acceptance. Because if, if mm. I'm happy with you treating me in one way, but you might not accept that. Yeah. You know, so that, that's where it becomes, the platinum rule makes it a bit more personal, is that you have to treat people the way they want to be treated. That, so what you're saying it. is, I get what you're saying. You're saying if if I'm someone who accepts getting uh, slapped playfully. Exactly. And you're someone who hates being touched. Mm. Uh, I, someone who accepts getting slapped playfully, will slap you because I'm okay getting slapped. But then you're going to be really upset and you're never going to slap me because you really don't do that so that that creates an imbalance and everything needs to be balanced remember yeah, yeah, it's there's all about a balance that. it's all so about so that's balance. that's a good point do unto others what you want done unto you uh kind but there's of there's a caveat there is definitely that caveat because you need to put yourself in that person's shoes and actually do unto them what they would want to be done unto them <laughs> in, in a way yeah, yeah, yeah no it's, it's, it's right it's weird but yeah. that's your quote now <laughs> I mean, sure. Take, take uh, credit, uh, but but that's it. In but, a sense. but in my but it takes time. That's and see, that's where we take quotes too far. So if you take it literally, you know, I might end up slapping you because I'm okay being slapped. But in my head, it's just the the root of the quote, and what it really means is just generally be nice to people. That's that's all it is, yeah. right? Be kind, be compassionate. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. On, on the good side, it works. Yeah. It's not. Uh, but I think it's the same it's with fallible. everything. Like if you take things too deeply and mm. too much at face value, uh, it's you're just going to end up on the wrong side of the quote. You yeah, know? true. True. If you take the road less traveled every time, you're going to end up lost in a forest and you're going to die. Right. And, and, and yeah, survival kind of heuristics tell you that if many people have taken this road, there's a reason. Yeah. In a sense. Even right? though that's not what the quote means. But yeah. yes, that's how we take it. Yeah. 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 And, and, and yeah, again, it's a really great point around how quotes contradict each other and yeah. how they, you know, they change with times. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, I think it's, it's a good note to kind of, uh, you know, close the episode as well. Right. Uh, yeah. In a sense that there's there's a lot of quotes out there. Uh, they mean different things. Look up the quotes, the context of the quote before quoting it. Yeah. And uh, tell us on Instagram or whatever what quotes yeah. really resonate with you and why they resonate with you. Yeah. Cool. And subscribe if you're not subscribed. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you, right. Sammy. Thanks, Tarek. Good one.